On the Mount of Olives, there was a garden called Gethsemane, a place where Jesus often went with his disciples. On this night, after the Passover meal, they went to Gethsemane once more. At the entrance to the garden, Jesus stopped. He shivered, but not from the cold. He knew what he had to do, and he knew that once he entered this garden, there would be no turning back. Jesus faced his disciples. Stay here near the gate, he said. I am going into the garden to pray. Peter, James, John, you come with me. He turned then and walked into the garden, followed by the three disciples who were closest to him. He was not alone, yet a great sense of loneliness came over him. For years now he had lived with them as a man among men, but tonight he would be more alone than any other man has ever been. He thought of what he would have to face in the next few hours, and tears came into his eyes. Never before had he known such sadness, a sorrow so deep that it felt as if it would kill him. This is the saddest night of my life, Jesus said to his three companions. I feel as if my heart will break. You wait here and pray. I will go on ahead and pray alone. Then Jesus walked on into the garden, leaving Peter, James, and John behind. They tried to pray, but they were so exhausted and sad that one by one they fell asleep. All alone, the Lord Jesus himself knelt down to pray. I know you love me, Father, he said. And I know that you can do anything. So please, Father, if there is any way for me to escape the suffering of this night, please let it be so. I don't want to go through with it. Oh, Father, it is too much for me. He bowed down on the ground, his body racked with sobs of grief. Then Jesus felt someone touch his hand. Looking up through his tears, he saw a man standing in front of him. It was not one of the disciples come to comfort him. They were all sound asleep. It was one of God's angels. He knew that Jesus was suffering and had come to give him comfort. Jesus stood up then and walked back to where he had left his disciples. He found them fast asleep, so he gently woke them. Peter, he said, couldn't you even stay with me this one hour? Stay here and pray. Ask the Father to keep you from being led away by temptation. I know your spirits are willing. Unfortunately, your bodies are weak. This time, Jesus went deeper into the garden alone to pray. He realized now how truly alone he was. Neither man nor angel could stand with him. The burden of it all crushed him down, and again he began to pray. Father, I do not want to drink this cup of suffering being poured for me. If there is any other way, Father, please do not make me go through this. Take this cup away from me. But if there is no other way, then I will drink it. May your will be done. Once more, Jesus went back to his disciples. All three had gone off to sleep again. This time, he did not even wake them. None of them could really pray with him, because they could not understand what he was going through. He left them to their sleep and went back into the dark garden once more to pray. And for the third time he prayed, Father, if it is possible, please take this cup of suffering away from me. He groaned in the agony of his suffering. Everything in him said, no, you were not meant to die, but to live. You were made to enjoy God's creation, not to suffer. Yet at the same time, his whole being cried out, You were made to do God's will. You were made to serve him. And Jesus' suffering was so great that his sweat rolled down his forehead and neck like big drops of blood. And then, at last, a great calm came over Jesus. Yes, mankind was created for life. 
but so that people could live again, he would have to die. Father, he said, I will do your will, not my own. He lay still a few minutes more, recovering his strength, before he stood to go. Not far away he could see the glow of torches being carried slowly up the hill. Now it begins, he thought. Now let Satan have his way, but I will defeat him in what he thinks is his moment of greatest victory. Let it begin. The torches were closer now, and Jesus could already hear the muffled voices of the men outside the garden. Wake up, he called to his disciples. The time has come. Look, here comes the one who is betraying me. The disciples sat up, groggy and confused, rubbing their eyes in the eerie glow of the torches. One moment they had been asleep, and the next moment there were voices and lights and the clanging of swords being drawn. There were temple guards and servants of the chief priests, and in front of them all was Judas Iscariot. Which one is he? whispered one of the guards to Judas. The one I will kiss, he answered. Judas walked forward slowly until he stood directly in front of Jesus. Hello, master, he said, and he leaned forward to kiss him. Would you betray me with a kiss, Judas? Jesus asked. Judas looked at him strangely, then leaned forward again and kissed him on the cheek. Suddenly, all was confusion. Guards were seizing everyone in sight. Peter, John, Andrew, Thomas, and some were moving quickly toward Jesus. Then Jesus stepped past Judas toward the guards, and in the same strong voice he had used to teach thousands of people in the open air, he called out, Who are you after? The guards stopped short in surprise. Jesus of Nazareth, the commander answered. I am he, Jesus said calmly. At his words, the men fell backward as if they had been struck in the face. A power they could not understand drove them to the ground. There was fear in the eyes of the guards now. What kind of man was this who could overpower them without lifting a finger? Who did you say you want? Jesus asked again. Jesus of Nazareth, the officer replied at last but his voice was not as certain this time. I told you I am the one, Jesus said to him. Take me and let these others go. The guards slowly got to their feet and moved cautiously toward Jesus. But before anyone knew what was happening, Peter leaped in front of them, pulling a sword from under his robe. He yelled and swung at the man closest to him, one of the high priest's servants. The man ducked to one side, but the blade caught him on the side of the head and cut off his ear. Put down your sword, Jesus said in a voice that made Peter drop it to the ground with a clatter. People who live by the sword will die by the sword. If I needed help, I could ask the Father, and he would send twelve armies of angels to fight for me. But it must happen this way. Then he stooped down and picked up the servant's severed ear. Quickly he pressed it back in place, and the man's wound was healed. Am I a thief, that you have to come out for me with swords? Jesus asked the priest's men as he held out his hands toward them. I taught every day in the temple, and you didn't arrest me there. You work in the dark, and your power comes from the darkness. But it had to happen this way, so that what scripture said would come true. When the guards saw that Jesus was not going to resist, they seized him and led him away. As for the disciples, they ran away as fast as they could, leaving Jesus alone with his captors. The eastern sky was brightening with the glow of dawn when they brought Jesus to the courtroom of Caiaphas, the high priest. The scribes and the members of the Sanhedrin who opposed Jesus were waiting for him. So was Anas the old high priest whom Governor Pilate had replaced with Caiaphas, Anas' son-in-law. In the shadows behind Jesus and his captors came Peter, slinking through the darkness, watching to see what would happen. 
I demand that you explain yourself, Anas said. What have you been teaching the people? What have your disciples been saying about you? Jesus looked him straight in the eye. I have not been hiding in the hills, teaching in secret, he said. I have spoken in synagogues all over Judea and Galilee, and in the temple itself. If you want to know about my teaching, ask those who heard me. This answer made the men of the council so angry that one of them slapped Jesus hard across the face. How dare you talk to the high priest that way, he shouted. But Jesus said to Anas, If I have said something evil, then come right out and say so. But if not, what right do you have to hit me? Enough of this, broke in Caiaphas. Bring in the witnesses. And through the door came a couple of the sorriest looking men any of them had seen in a long time. For days, those who hated Jesus had searched for anyone who would accuse Jesus of breaking the law, but they couldn't find anyone, not even one of the Pharisees who had argued with him in the temple. Finally, they found some scoundrels who could be bribed to say anything at all, and those were the men who now came into the council chamber to testify against Jesus. There he is! There's the man! one of them shouted pointing his finger at Jesus. What did he do? He's the one who cursed God's temple. We heard him, didn't we? He nudged his companion with his elbow. Yes, yes, he's the one, the other agreed. What did he say? asked one of the council members. The man looked confused for a moment. Then he remembered. We heard him say, if you destroy this temple, I will build it again in three days. He made himself greater than the temple. If that isn't a curse, I don't know what is. Caiaphas groaned to himself. Is that the best they could do for witnesses? This was getting them nowhere. What kind of testimony is that? He barked. Get out of here. One after another, the bribed false witnesses came into the chamber. He taught men to break the Sabbath, one said. No, said the next. He said he was greater than the Sabbath. A scribe said, he made himself greater than the law. But when the council members asked him what he meant, he couldn't give an explanation. The members of the council, like Caiaphas, just wanted any old accusation that would stick under Hebrew law. There were questions and shouts and arguments but no one could get the witnesses to agree with each other or give consistent testimony. Finally, Caiaphas himself stepped forward. Enough, he shouted. Jesus of Nazareth, what do you have to say to these accusations? Jesus did not answer. Nothing, I see, Caiaphas went on. There is no reason why you should. There is only one question that is important. I command you, in the name of God, to answer me this question. Do you claim to be the Messiah? The, it burns my tongue to say it, the Son of the living God? There was a deathly silence in the room, and all eyes turned to Jesus. I am, he said, and the day will come when you will see me sitting at the right hand of God, coming on the clouds of heaven. With a loud cry of pain, the high priest snatched off his robe and tore it in two. There is no need for more witnesses, he shouted. You've all heard it with your own ears. This man has condemned himself out of his own mouth. He makes himself equal with God. It is blasphemy. What is your verdict? Again, the room was filled with shouts and cries. Blasphemy! Blasphemy! He has insulted God himself. He is guilty and he must die. In their anger and hatred, some of them began to spit on Jesus. One man grabbed him from behind and held his hands over Jesus' eyes, while another one punched him hard in the pit of his stomach. Now, prophet, tell us which one of us hit you, he shouted. Stop it, Caiaphas commanded. Leave him alone for now. As soon as all the members of the council are here, 
we will give our judgment. But everyone knew what the judgment would be. Jesus was about to be condemned to death. Peter stood outside the high priest's courtyard, waiting in the shadows to see what would happen. But John had already gone into the court where Jesus was, because he was known by the high priest. Only these two, Peter and John, had followed Jesus. The others had all gone into hiding, still afraid that they would be arrested. When John saw Peter standing outside in the shadows, he spoke to the servant girl who was the doorkeeper. Let that man in too, he said quietly. She beckoned to Peter, who stepped quickly through the door. Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples too, she whispered. No, I'm not, Peter answered and walked into the courtyard. There was a fire crackling in the center of the open court, and the guards were warming their hands. Peter was so cold that he couldn't stay away from the fire. But as he stepped closer, and the firelight lit up his face, one of the servants standing nearby said, I saw you with Jesus of Nazareth. I don't know what you're talking about, Peter replied nervously, and walked back into the shadows near the doorway. He stood there for more than an hour, listening to the laughter of the guards, wondering what was going on inside the house, frightened that he might be arrested, but too concerned to leave. Suddenly, the door to the high priest's house opened. There in the doorway stood Jesus, his hands bound. Peter stepped out of the shadow to get a better look, and the firelight once more lit up his face. There is one of them, shouted one of the high priest's men. He was with Jesus when we arrested him in the garden. He cut off my cousin Malchus' ear. No, no, I wasn't there, Peter cried desperately. I've never even heard of him. But the man grabbed Peter by the arm and pulled him closer to the fire. Of course you were there, he said. You even talk like you're from Galilee. You must be one of his disciples. So help me, I'm telling you the truth. I don't know the man. As the man let go of Peter's arm, a rooster crowed to greet the rising sun. Jesus turned and sadly looked at Peter. In that moment, Peter remembered what Jesus had said, and the words went home like an arrow through his heart. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. A cry of anguish rose in Peter's throat and he ran out into the night, weeping bitter tears. The rumors had spread through Jerusalem like wildfire that morning. Jesus of Nazareth was under arrest. The Sanhedrin was going to have him stoned to death. King Herod had put him in the same prison where he had kept John the Baptist. Jesus was going to call out armies of angels to fight the Romans. Jesus was dead already. No, he was still alive. Outside Pilate's palace was an open courtyard where the people came to appear before the governor. There he gave his decisions on important matters. Now the courtyard was filling with people. Many of them were zealots who hoped that their comrade Barabbas would be released. Others were friends of the Sanhedrin, leaders of the Pharisees, priests from the temple, supporters of King Herod as many as the Jewish leaders could find who hated Jesus. His enemies tried to turn away anybody who might tell Pilate to release Jesus. The crowd inside was packed against him. Inside his palace, Pontius Pilate paced worriedly. He knew he was in trouble. It was a mistake for any Roman ruler to get involved in the Jews' own religious quarrels. Why did he have to rule these stubborn people? Caius Pontius. Pilate whirled around at the sound of his first name. Claudia, what are you doing here? His wife's eyes had dark circles under them from the lack of sleep, and her face was creased with worry. Caius, I have seen the prisoner Herod sent to you. Claudia, you shouldn't worry yourself about these. But Caius, she said, this is the man I dreamed about. I don't know why it bothers me so much, 
but I am sure it has some terrible meaning for you. Please don't have anything to do with him. I know it will mean disaster for you. Claudia, I am the governor, Pilate replied. I will do what I must. Frustrated and troubled, Pilate watched his wife leave the room. Did she think he could govern Judea on dreams? Still, her concern bothered him. He shook his head in determination. He had work to do. Bring the prisoners out to the judgment porch, he called to his servants. A hush fell over the crowd when Pilate appeared and took his seat in judgment. When the prisoners were led out, the crowd broke into wild cheering. On one side stood Jesus, on the other side stood Barabbas, the notorious rebel leader who had robbed and killed in his attempt to overthrow the Romans. Pilate raised his hand for silence, and once more quiet fell in the court of judgment. The only sound was the weeping of the few who loved Jesus. It is the custom, Pilate began in his strong voice, that the governor of Judea should release one prisoner in honor of your Passover feast. In my love for the Jewish people, here he was interrupted by boos from the crowd, and one or two shook their fists in the air. In my love for the Jewish people, Pilate went on, I have decided to honor this custom. You see before you two prisoners, on my right, accused of murder and revolution, is the prisoner Barabbas. The crowd below him again broke out into such noisy cheering that once more he had to raise his hand to quiet them. On my left stands Jesus of Nazareth, who claims to be the king of the Jews. Which one shall I release to you? Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! the crowd screamed. There were a few who cried out, Jesus! Jesus! But the zealots in the crowd and the priests and the Pharisees quickly hushed them. Pilate frowned. He had not counted on this. He motioned to the guards to follow him back into the inner chamber with the prisoners. Take that man away, Pilate said, pointing to Barabbas, but be ready to bring him back. And take the other one away and whip him. Perhaps that will satisfy that bloodthirsty mob. They led Jesus away, down the cold stone steps, to the prison below the palace. Torches and brackets on the walls flickered in the dark dungeon. Mounted on the wall were brass rings that were used to tie up prisoners for flogging. Raising Jesus' bound hands over his head, they tied him to one of the rings and took off his robe. "'What's this one here for?' asked the whipmaster, as he grasped the handle of the whip in his hand. He swung the whip up over his head and brought it down with a sharp crack across the back of the prisoner. Some kind of Jewish prophet, I think, the captain of the guard answered, claims to be king of the Jews. Again and again, the whip came down on Jesus until his back was crisscrossed with bleeding welts. That's enough, the captain said finally. We don't want to kill him yet. He picked up Jesus' robe and put it back on the prisoner's shoulders. Wait a minute, said one of the men. A king should have a robe. What about the one King Herod sent along? Good idea, said the captain. So they brought Herod's purple robe and put it on Jesus. Now he needs a crown. What can we use for a crown? There's a thorn bush in the courtyard, one of the soldiers suggested. We could make one out of that. Good idea, said the captain. Do you think he'll get the point? And they laughed at their little joke. The thorns were long and sharp, and the soldier who wove the crown pricked his fingers more than once. When it was finally done, he brought it back and jammed it onto the prisoner's head. Jesus winced in pain as the thorns punctured his skin, and little trickles of blood began to run down his forehead. Pilate went back out again and said to them, I present him to you. But I want you to know that I do not find him guilty of any crime. Just then, Jesus came out wearing the thorn crown and purple robe. Pilate announced, Here he is, the man. 
when the high priests and police saw him they shouted in a frenzy crucify crucify pilate told them you take him you crucify him i find nothing wrong with him the jews answered we have a law and by that law he must die because he claimed to be the son of god when pilate heard this he became even more scared he went back into the palace and said to jesus where did you come from jesus gave no answer pilate said you won't talk don't you know that i have the authority to pardon you and the authority to crucify you jesus said you haven't a shred of authority over me except what has been given you from heaven that's why the one who betrayed me to you has committed a far greater fault at this pilate tried his best to pardon him but the jews shouted him down if you pardon this man you're no friend of caesar's anyone setting himself up as king defies caesar when pilate heard those words he led jesus outside he sat down at the judgment seat in the area designated stone court it was the preparation day for passover the hour was noon pilate said to the jews here is your king they shouted back kill him kill him crucify him pilate said i am to crucify your king the high priest answered we have no king except caesar pilate caved in to their demand he turned him over to be crucified they took jesus away carrying his cross jesus went out to the place called skull hill as they led him off they made simon a man from cyrene who happened to be coming in from the countryside carry the cross behind jesus a huge crowd of people followed along with women weeping and carrying on at one point jesus turned to the women and said daughters of jerusalem don't cry for me cry for yourselves and for your children the time is coming when they'll say lucky the women who never conceived lucky the wombs that never gave birth lucky the breasts that never gave milk then they'll start calling to the mountains fall down on us calling to the hills cover us up if people do these things to a live green tree can you imagine what they'll do with dead wood jesus went out to what is called the place of the skull which in hebrew is called golgotha there they crucified him and with him two others one on either side with jesus between them pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross it read jesus of nazareth the king of the jews many of the jews read this inscription because the place where jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in hebrew in latin and in greek then the chief priests of the jews said to pilate do not write the king of the jews but this man said i am king of the jews pilate answered what i have written i have written when the soldiers had crucified jesus they took his clothes and divided them into four parts one for each soldier they also took his tunic now the tunic was seamless woven in one piece from the top so they said to one another let us not tear it but cast lots for it to see who will get it this was to fill what the scripture says they divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots and this is what the soldiers did the people in the crowd were beginning to shout now come on christ they taunted i thought you were going to tear down the temple and build it again in three days can't you even tear down a cross if you are the messiah prove it come down from the cross you saved other people now save yourself if god loves you so much how come he doesn't save you the thief on jesus left joined in with them big man he shouted if you're so great you could save all three of us some messiah you are king of israel ha hush 
The thief on Jesus' right blurted out, What right do you have to talk to him that way? Don't you even respect God? We're both getting exactly what we deserve, but he didn't do anything wrong. Leave him alone. Then his voice grew softer, and he said, Jesus, if you are really the Messiah, will you think of me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus turned his head toward him and said, I assure you, this very day you will be with me in paradise. The thief looked at Jesus in astonishment. I think you really are the Messiah, he said. Then tired from the effort of speaking and weak from his wounds, he allowed his head to drop onto his chest. Despite the pain that racked his body, he felt a strange sense of joy. Today, Jesus had said, today you will be with me in paradise. Behind the line of Roman soldiers, surrounded by those who were shouting insults at Jesus, stood a small group of his friends. His mother was there, along with Mary Magdalene and several other women who had faithfully helped him during his ministry. And the disciple John was also with them. Through their tears, they watched as Jesus was nailed to the cross and raised up above the earth. They had heard the sound of the hammers striking the nails, had heard the coarse laughter of the Roman soldiers. Now that all the crosses had been raised, the soldiers were allowing the families of the dying men to come closer. As Jesus' mother and his other friends approached the cross, the light of the sun began to fade, even though it was only noon, and darkness was beginning to cover the countryside like an approaching storm. In Jerusalem, lamps were being lit, John saw this and wondered what was happening. Mother, the voice from the cross was quiet but still strong. Mary looked up at her son, wiping away her tears. Mother, Jesus said, take John to be your son. John, she is your mother now. The strange darkness was deepening. The shouting of the crowd died away as the people looked fearfully at the blackened sky. The soldiers were frightened, too, but they covered their fear with their joking. Their laughter mingled with the women's weeping at the foot of Jesus' cross, and the moans of pain from the two thieves made for a very eerie atmosphere in the gathering dark. It is finished, Jesus exclaimed. The work God had given him to do, the task for which he had come into the world, was completed. Now he could give up his life just as he had said he would. Standing at the foot of the cross, John remembered the words Jesus had spoken. No man can take my life from me. I will give it up on my own. Then, in a voice loud enough to be heard by all who stood around, Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head and died. The officer in charge of the Roman guard looked up at Jesus. He had seen many prisoners die, but never one who faced death the way Jesus did. This man was no criminal, he said aloud. He was a son of God. In Jerusalem, men and women ran screaming from their houses as the earth began to quake and tremble. Dishes clattered to the floor, and pieces of brick fell from the tops of buildings to the street below. A few of the weaker buildings collapsed completely. At the temple, the frightened priests watched as the walls began to tremble, but not a stone was shaken from its place. The earthquake passed at last, and the priests nervously went back to their duties. But moments later, a horrified priest came running from the holy place, where he had gone to put more incense on the altar. "'The curtain is gone!' he shouted. The curtain has torn in two. The Holy of Holies is open. And it was true. The curtain had torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the Holy of Holies was open to plain view. The place where the Ark of God's covenant had once stood, the sign of his presence among his people. Ever since the first tent of worship had been erected in the wilderness, only the high priest had been allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. Now, because of the death of Jesus, 
The way into God's presence was open to everyone. Pontius Pilate was amazed when he heard that Jesus was already dead. The man who stood before him was an honorable man, a member of the Sanhedrin, but one of the few who did not agree to the sentence passed on Jesus. What I tell you is true, Your Excellency, Joseph of Arimathea insisted. Now sunset is approaching, and we Jews can do no work once the Sabbath begins. So please, let me take the body and lay it in a tomb before the day ends. How very strange, Pilate thought. Here is a man who, by his own testimony, was afraid to be on Jesus' side while the man was still alive. Now that Jesus is dead, he risks his reputation to come to me. What sort of man was this Jesus? Send for the captain of the crucifixion detail, Pilate said. The captain confirmed what Joseph had said. All right, Pilate said to Joseph. You may take the body down and bury it. Captain, go with him, and see to it that my order is carried out. Outside Pilate's palace, Joseph rejoined his friend Nicodemus, who had brought with him spices and oils for the burial. Joseph himself had brought a new linen cloth to wrap the body in. Let's move quickly before the sun sets, Joseph said. So they carried Jesus' body to the cave Joseph had ordered for his own burial. Now the grave would hold the body of the man who, even in death, had no place to call his own. They laid his body tenderly in the tomb and began to wrap it with the linen cloth and the spices. But it was late and there was no time to finish the task. We will have to return Sunday morning, Joseph said. Let's roll the stone in front of the cave to seal it now and go home for the Sabbath. Outside the tomb, they rejoined Mary and Mary Magdalene and the other women. The sun was just setting as they solemnly left the tomb and went to their own homes. It was all over. All their hopes had come to this, to death and the grave. What would they do now that Jesus was dead? Would their lives still hold any meaning?